traditional established professional uh, in, in the field of data science. In this session, we are still showcasing African women in data science. We have inspirational young professionals or rather early career women who are making a mark in this field. Um, in this session, we have three speakers and I will introduce each and every one of the speakers. Our first speaker is Fanami Randria Mahen Nyaswa, who is from Madagascar and works as a data scientist at Voxcroft Analytics in South Africa. She holds an MSc in Computer System Management, Software Engineering and AI from ISPM, Institute Superior Polytechnique de Madagascar. She originally comes from a software engineering background, working as a software developer before moving into data science. She was part of the 2020 intake of the highly competitive Africa Data Science Intensive DSI program that is run by Sarawo as well as the Dara Big Data. She is keen to foster access to better training and education for young female data science enthusiasts as she believes there's a huge amount of untapped potential across Africa. She is passionate about music, an interest she follows in her spare time. She sees data science as an art form and has worked on intriguing projects that bring data science and music together. Fanambi, you can take the mic. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for the great presentation. And I'm happy to have you all here. And I'm going to share with you my data science journey, how I became a data scientist from a software engineering background. And it's going to be a bit of a storytelling to inspire you. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen now. Okay, can you see it now? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to start uh, uh, with my background. Um, as already mentioned, I have a master in science uh, in business informatics, software engineering and artificial intelligence from Madagascar. And I was also part of the data science intensive program in 2022. And as my last job experiences, I was working as a part-time software developer, and then I was working as a research and development engineer before moving towards data science. And um, now I'm currently working as a data scientist at Foxcroft Analytics. So I'm going to share with you what I'm doing there a bit later. Um, and how I met, um, how I was first exposed to the word of AI is in my third year at the university when we had an AI course and that at that time the lectures were just theoretical. So I started to get interested in and I was craving a lot more and I started to do a lot of um, researches about the field. But um, my, first, um, my first step into data science was in 2018, when I built and implemented my first data science project, which is a drumming robot. It, it is, um, the concept is uh, to build a robot that integrates a computer vision in it. And um, we'll, we use the computer vision to read a sheet of music um, using the computer's camera. And I was super excited to work on that project, but at that time I had a, a very um, limited knowledge of Python. But um, being a, a .NET um, developer at that time with my team, we decided to use .NET to, to build the first project. And the first lesson I got from that is that we did not want to think outside the box. So we um, struggled a lot in building the project and it partially worked, but not as um, expected and um, considered that as a failure. So um, I realized that I will need to upskill myself if I want to, to grow in the field. 
And I, I then started to look for a machine learning internship. Um, I networked with um, one of our lecturers um, who proposed uh, an internship um, within the company he was working for. And he kind of sold me to the company and then they hired me to work as a machine learning um, intern. But um, a few times later, I started to face my first challenges because um, my uh, project manager came to me and asked me to, to, to move towards research and development. So I started to work as a research and development engineer. Um, and I accepted because I thought that would really be valuable for me if I want to pursue my um, PhD later. But then I started to, to face many challenges and to ask questions to myself, like, um, am I going to the right direction? Am I going to, to pursue my PhD, going to academia or, um, or moving forward and um, enter the world of industry? And if so, where I will find the support, how will I grow in the field? And I started to, to, to um, ask many what if questions from there and I decided to 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 look for help so um I networked with one of my data scientist colleague and I asked if he could mentor me to become a real data scientist and um uh, enter the professional world of data science and um he accepted and um, taught me um, a lot of things, starting from upskilling my Python programming, how to play around with data, how to perform um, exploratory uh, data analysis, how to um, do, fe do, do features engineering. And he also showed me many um, various um, websites like Kaggle's in the data camp. So I started to do a lot of self-learning. And I was also searching for opportunities because I uh, really want to grow my network um, um, in the field. So that's when I um, started to explore beyond my boundaries and I found the announcement for the data science intensive program. Um, and um, I hesitated first to apply to the program because I was uh, like, um, I'm not skilled enough to get accepted to, to such a great program. And then I applied and then I passed the test and um, I got my place. Um, so I learned a lot from that program. The program is uh, kind of divided into four modules. We first started with um, a regression, a simple regression problems, and then we dive uh, into um, computer vision. And then we started doing natural language pre-processing. And the final project was uh, a, a personal capstone project. Um, and I decided to, to, to combine um, music and data science, um, the two of my passions um, to build my personal capstone project. And I built an emotional based recommendation system using um, a reinforcement learning. And I owe um, many things, I like, I would say I owe everything to that program um, because um, it really shaped me to become the data scientist as I am now. I achieved second out of the 16 participants and my personal project ranked first. And I also won um, the best coder award from the program. Um, and um, I also gained many, many um, technical and soft skills. Um, uh, and I met extraordinary people and it paid off because I um, growed my network and I grew my network and um, I was able to, um, to find my um, first data scientist job um, from that program. But being part of that program was um, also um, a bit challenging for me because I was struggling between my master's thesis. I had my R&D job and um, the program was still running and I could not handle 
the three of them at the same time. I couldn't um, give up on my master's thesis, so I had to choose between um, the data science intensive program and my R&D job. And um, I went for the data science intensive program, no matter what would happen after I chose to continue my journey to the end of the program. And this even made it possible for me to get my, um, my first job. So now I'm working as a data scientist at Voxcroft Analytics. So uh, Voxcroft Analytics, it, it is a global leader um, uh, in open source intelligence and risk analytics. It is based in South Africa. And the work they're doing is that they try to combine, combine AI and um, expert honed um, tracecraft and analytics to build and to deliver accurate insights to their customer. And I am um, invited to visit their, um, the company's website and blog because you will find many interesting um, articles and, um, in, in there. So my work there um, is focused on natural language processing, um, building a, a machine translation models for um, low resource languages. And for every single project that I am working on, um, I feel like my skills never stop uh, extending to new horizons. And I recently received the Voxcroft's Continued Excellence Award um, that my colleagues were um, voting for me. And I'm still super ex excited to work as a data scientist there. Um, so I'm going to share with you the lessons I learned during that um, long winded journey. Um, as first to stay focused, um, stay focused on your goal. Um, know what you want to do and always search for, um, for the right career path and the path that, you, that will help you to achieve your goal. And also enjoy continuous learning because that's the that's one of the major things that you will need if you want to grow in the field of data science. And that's one of, uh, I would say, one of the qualities that um, is required for a data scientist. And um, develop your creativity and your curiosity, um, sharpen your critical thinking, um, and uh, it is also important to find your allies and to grow your network because these people, they are willing to help you and they will pull you up if you need support and help. They will um, show you um, the right direction to go if you want to, 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 for example, if you want them to mentor you or to, to, to give you um, a little push and do not, undervalue soft skills that's one of the major things that i learned um as about working as a data scientist because um soft skills are also valuable for you if you want to apply for a job even if you're working as a data scientist you you will really need to 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 sharpen your um soft skills and most importantly um i love sharing this code with fellow data scientists enthusiasts. Um, you don't have to be a genius to be a scientist. And I will add, you don't have to be a genius to be a data scientist, but you do need to be persistent. Um, um, never be afraid of making mistakes. Be persistent. If you want to achieve your goal, be persistent. And that will lead you to what you were was searching for, because you know um, hard work will always pay off later. And um, that ends my presentation. I hope you got inspired by my journey and I'm happy to answer um, questions. Thank you so much, Fanambi, for sharing your journey. Uh, if there are any questions, you can just post it on the Q&A and uh, the speakers shall address it later in the Q&A session. Uh, for our next speaker, we have a pre-recorded talk. Um, however, I do have the honor of introducing the speaker. She will be available for the Q&A, uh, but the talk will be pre-recorded. Um, Christine, Christine the Cork is a PhD student in the natural 
Language and Information Processing Group at the University of Cambridge. Her research, funded by Huawei, focuses on online conversations and how to make disagreements more constructive. She started her career in data science in the Young Professionals Development Program at the SKA South Africa, now called Salao. After leaving this program, she gained a master's degree in artificial intelligence from the University of Edinburgh, graduating as a top female student. In 2019, she participated in expeditions led by the South African National Space Agency to both Antarctica and Marion Island as a volunteer in the science team. Uh, you can play the my name is Christine. Um, I am uh, currently a third year PhD student in computer science at the University of Cambridge. I feel very honored to be able to share my journey in data science with you, a journey in which the SKA has played a not insignificant role, which I'm very thankful for. Um, so this diagram represents my personal and professional history. I'd like to tell you about some important moments along the way and how they have shaped my development and my path. Um, so as you can see here, I come from Kimberley in the Northern Cape. I went to school there to Diamantfeld High School and I matriculated in 2012 as the top student in the Northern Cape. Um, I did my undergrad at the University of Stellenbosch. I studied industrial engineering. I, I really enjoyed my undergrad, but I have to admit I found it very challenging. Um, I dot, did not have um, a lot of the high school subjects they recommend you take, such as technical drawing and programming. <clears throat> but I was quite surprised to find that I really enjoyed programming um, against my expectations. So in the final year of my studies, I was also introduced to data science and I was able to do my honours project in data mining. I was immediately hooked on this area. It made complete sense to me that you should leverage data to inform decision making. Um, so I decided to do my master's in this field and I applied to the University of Edinburgh and was accepted. However, their school year starts in September, so I had some time to fill before I could start with that. Um, so I took a chance and I emailed Jasper Harrell at the SKA after reading a, an article about the work in data science that they do to process these large volumes of data that would be harvested by the SKA. Um, and I was really thrilled to eventually get hired into the Young Professionals Development Program at the SKA. Um, I was hired as a junior data scientist. I was assigned a project on pulsar de detection using neural networks. Um, this was a very important part in my professional development as it was my first time working with machine learning models, as well as my first time using Python, which I still use today. Um, without this background, I would have had a much more difficult time uh, when I started my master's. So this experience was incredibly valuable to me. Um, in fact, I spoke about the work I did there yesterday in a job interview with Spotify. <laughs> Um, as you can see in this photo, I also got the opportunity to visit the SKA site in the Karoo in my home province. Um, I left the SKA in August 2016 to start my master's study at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, I did an MSc in Artificial Intelligence, which is an informatics degree. So this pivoted away from my engineering undergrad a bit and allowed me to gain a deeper theoretical understanding of the topics I had started to discover during my internship. Um, I graduated as the top female student in my class, which I'm very proud of. Um, computer science as a field is still, still has a very big gap between the number of men versus women, um, even more so than engineering in my experience. I was funded by the um, Oppenheimer Memorial Trust. International study is generally very expensive um, and the trust have funding allocated specifically for international postgraduate study and they've been very generous towards me. Um, I would highly recommend you look them up if this is of interest to you. I was also partially funded by NASPERS, a South African company, and in return for this funding I agreed to work, work for Media24 when I got back from Edinburgh. So Media24 is a company owned by NASPERS, um, which in turn owns News24 and other platforms. So after my master's, I moved back from back to Cape Town and um, spent two years working as a data scientist for them. 
also continuing some of the research I had started during my master's. Uh, while working there, I was actually tasked to find a solution to the hate speech problem that exists in the comment spaces of the platform. So essentially people can be very toxic and hateful towards one another when they reply to comments on, um, on the, the platform's news articles. So um, yeah, doing a bit of research, I realized that this is actually quite a widespread problem also in other countries and at you know, platforms such as the New York Times and the Washington Post. Um, so yeah, I'd always wanted to do a PhD, so I thought maybe this would be a good topic. So I started looking around for supervisors who might want to take this on. I spoke to a number of people before eventually coming across Andreas Vlachos, who is now my supervisor, and he agreed to support my application to Cambridge. But um, before leaving South Africa again, there was another thing I really wanted to do which I was actually introduced to at an open day I attended with the SKA back in 2016. I desperately wanted to visit Antarctica. Uh, from the moment I heard that people from the South African National Space Agency were going there every year and doing science, I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. So I applied and was accepted as a volunteer in the um, takeover expedition in December 2018. So yeah, we spent three months in Antarctica, returning in March 2019. I then did a second expedition to Marion Island, which is also a territory of South Africa in the, the Southern Ocean. It was a truly incredible experience and absolutely once in a lifetime thing. Um, my friends like to refer to this as my gap year, since I effectively took a break from my actual career to do this. But I don't regret doing it for a second. It has really enriched my life. Um, and it really also has opened up other doors. Um, <laughs> one of these being, I actually had my Cambridge admission interview while I was in Antarctica using the satellite phone on the base. Um, it was luckily successful, even though a bit unconventional. Um, and I started my, uh, with my PhD in October 2019. Um, yeah, I mean, since then it's been a whole lot of COVID and, you know, uncertainty in the world. But as I mentioned earlier, I'm currently in the third year of my PhD. Um, I'm in the Department of Computer Science working on a project in natural language processing. So this is now very far removed from my undergrad in industrial engineering. Um, my studies are funded by both Huawei and then once again, the Oppenheimer Memorial Trust. Um, and my work looks at modeling conversations online, specifically disagreements. Um, I hope to submit my thesis by the end of this year, more or less, we'll see. Um, so to conclude, I have formulated a couple of thoughts on principles that have helped me along my profes professional journey. And to be clear, these are quite specific to my experiences and will probably differ from what has worked for others but I do hope this is of some use. Firstly, um, be bold and ask for what you want. I think as women, we are primed to be a bit meek and not assert ourselves as much, but a number of the opportunities I've been able to pursue were things um, that I thought were a long shot, but just took a chance and asked. For instance, my job at the SKA and my PhD position were both initiated by random emails from me to people who could assist me. And of course, I've had very many rejections by doing this um, on other things, but I've had to learn that you can't take this personally and you can't let this deter you from asking again in the future. Um, secondly, it has helped me tremendously to build and maintain strong interpersonal relationships. For me, this has meant to really care for the people I work with and to maintain those connections when I move on to a new role. Um, most importantly, because it makes for a happier life, but also because it can pay off significantly in the long run. Uh, for instance, helping you get a trip to Antarctica. But also, I still have very wonderful friends from my time at the SKA, such as Isabella, who's one of the organizers today. Um, and then thirdly, I found that small things that you do to sort of go the extra mile can have a compounding effect in the, in the long term. Um, 
I got my master's scholarship and my job at Media 24 through a connection that I made by working for the student newspaper as an undergrad. You never know what could potentially get you your next break, but going beyond what is expected gets you noticed. And then finally, um, don't worry if your journey does not look exactly like your peers. Um, what I mean by this is, firstly, uh, women in academia often experience social pressures from friends having children, etc., which is not necessarily compatible with the early career of a researcher, where you work long hours and you tend to move around a lot. So just know that this is fine and normal and it will all work out. And then secondly, I personally tend to want to, um, to plan everything out. But the fact is that my journey up to this point has involved a great deal of luck and randomness and uncertainty. Of course, um, you need to put the work in and look around for opportunities, but it also helps to be flexible and to trust that it will all unfold beautifully as it should. Um, yeah, I hope this has been a bit helpful to give you an idea of what a career in data science might look like. Um, I look forward to hearing about what all of you have done and still will do in the future in the field of data science. And with that, I wish you a very happy International Women's Day and Women's Month. Thank you, Christine, for uh, sharing your journey as well as uh, the lessons. For our last speaker, we have an inspiring young data scientist, Dr. Zafira Hosseini, who is a postdoc scientist at Microsoft Research in Cambridge, working in the mixed reality and AI lab. She completed a, a PhD at Jodrell Bank Center for Astrophysics. JBCA at the University of Manchester, where she focused on machine learning for astronomy. Born in Mauritius, she did her undergraduate studies in physics at the University of Mauritius. She was then awarded the Square Kilometer Array SKA Master's Bursary and embarked upon an MSc in astrophysics and space science at the University of Cape Town and Northwest University. She has an avid passion for technology and her research interests include developing automated pipelines using ML for classification purposes in image domain, time domain, and in imbalanced machine learning problems. Zafira, you can go ahead and present. Thank you, Sadia, for the introductions. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm so privileged and so honored to be sharing like this afternoon with you all. So I'm Zafira, I'm a postdoc research scientist uh, uh, at Microsoft Research Lab, Cambridge. So before diving into uh, the talk, I will just share a little bit about my journey and uh, also my interest into data science. And also like, I will just give you a little bit uh, about my, like it, I will just tell you a little bit more about the project that I've been working during my masters, my PhD and some uh, of the work that uh, I've been working uh, at uh, Microsoft. So to start with, so I am from Mauritius. I've completed my degree in physics. And then afterward, I moved to South Africa to pursue a master's in astrophysics and space science at the University of uh, Cape Town and Northwest University. So my master's has been fully funded by the SK bursary. Afterward, back in 2018, I moved to Manchester where I've uh, pursued a PhD in machine learning and astronomy. So my PhD has been fully funded by the Dara Big Data. So last year uh, in the pandemic, so I've joined uh, Microsoft as a postdoc research scientist, and uh, I've been mostly working in the mixed reality and AI field. So uh, my interest uh, in data science started back in, uh, I would say 2015, where I've got the opportunity to attend the fir my first uh, data science workshop in Mauritius. So from there, uh, I've moved, uh, I've got like the opportunity to move to Cape Town, where I've got the opportunity to be working uh, with Professor Bruce Bassett and Dr. Nadim and the team. 
And uh, I've got also uh, like the chance of attending various workshops in Stellenbosch in Johannesburg. And uh, during those uh, workshops, I've got like lots of opportunities uh, as well, like to be working on like uh, machine learning projects, uh, including like, for example, like in terms of uh, healthcare, in terms of climate and as well as astronomy. So during those workshops, I would say I've taken the opportunity to present my work as well and also uh, to present like poster presentation. And uh, one of the pictures here, you will see that I've got like uh, one of the best poster presentation during uh, the deep learning in DABA, the first deep learning in DABA in Johannesburg. So this way I've got the opportunity to meet uh, like leading researchers in a computer science field. For example, here it is a uh, professor uh, Nando de Freita, who is a leading researcher in uh, computer science. And, um, like the, the major takeaway from this slide is mostly to for participants when they are attending uh, workshops, like I would say like for them to enjoy the, the experience, to learn, to grow and to network. This is very important. So the next uh, few slides will be mostly about my, uh, a little bit about the project that I've been working during my masters as well as PhD. So it will be a little bit technical, but not that much. So uh, during my masters, I've been working with Professor Bruce Bassett and Dr. Nadine Musia on source classification using machine learning techniques. And uh, I would uh, like the main the main uh, aim of this project was uh, to perform like classification algorithm uh, of radio galaxies, and we mainly focused on FR1 and FR2, which is Van der Type One and Type Two galaxies. So at this time, uh, when we were trying, uh, it was back in 2016, I think. So when we were trying to use a deep learning algorithm, so we didn't have so much data and uh, we were having like around hundreds of data uh, of these uh, types of galaxies. So this is very challenging to do like deep learning with uh, these uh, number of samples. So we came up with the idea of generating uh, like um, realistic looking radio images. And this is how it looks when we apply generative adversarial network, which is mostly GAN. And we perform the classification. So from there, uh, this is where like, this actually triggered my uh, interest in data science. And I really wanted to continue working in this field in astronomy and machine learning. And this is where like, I've applied for the DARA Big Data uh, uh, funding, uh, I would say scholarship. And uh, this is where I've started my PhD at the University of Manchester where I've started working uh, with Professor Ben Staffers and Dr. Robert Lyon. And during my PhD, I've got the opportunity to also uh, work with leading researchers in Netherlands, Cape Town, uh, UK, on transients and variable stars classification. So the question one, one will ask is why we are using machine learning in astronomy? So the first one is we are receiving a large amount of data. The second one is transients and variable stars are, I would say, are like uh, rapidly fading sources. As you can see in this animation, you will see that these are only visible, like you will know that time series data, these are only visible for a very limited amount of time for follow-up. Therefore, we need to have like an algorithm to be able to detect that at very early stage um, when these are being like observed. And uh, in the false detection pipeline, we have noticed that we have large amount of uh, noise data. So we need to find a way of getting rid of those. This is where like with uh, different researchers from Netherlands, Cape Town, we came up uh, and then UK, we came up with the approach of um, getting a pipeline to work in an automated way. So in this, we have developed like Mircrop which is uh, where we use the Mialica uh, telescope and we gather data and where researchers have been uh, labeling those data and we have been using like a supervised approach to be able to, um, to, be able to classify between, I would say interesting uh, objects versus uh, noise objects. So once we have trained the data, uh, the algorithm, so, and we have evaluated our model. So we, uh, we use uh, the model and we deploy that into like runtime. So the idea is we want to remove like a uh, human in the loop. And uh, this is where like, like during, um, I would say um, on, during 
observation. So these data will pass through different processes and will use that algorithm to be able to perform prediction, whether it is a real or a robust. So I would say the next um, uh, project that I've been working is mostly on um, localizing and detecting objects in images. So I've been applying these techniques in computer science to radio astronomy, where I wanted to uh, not only classify between objects, but I really wanted to get more information in terms of the probability with, uh, of the objects, the location, as well as the mask. Here in this project, uh, what our aim is, is we really wanted to get the location of the of that object, which is force radio burst here. And we wanted uh, to classify between FRB and then uh, RFI, which is mostly noise. So we pass that through a network, which, which is known as MOS or CNN. And then at the end, we got like the location of that uh, uh, object that is a uh, force radio burst here. And then we'll get the probability that is, it is like an FRB and then the mask. The mask here will be very useful in terms of gathering statistics of that uh, source. That is, uh, for example, the dispersion measure or the time uh, from that image. So these are some of the results that we obtain uh, from this algorithm. So you will note that uh, you will note that from that uh, result, we have managed to get the location of that uh, particular objects, and then from there we get the probability that is that it is uh, an FOB. And then we can calculate based on that mass, we can calculate some statistics uh, that is the dispersion measure and time here. And these can be used further for further analysis, like what types of sources and so on. And um, like when I've been working on these projects and uh, I've seen that my interest in terms of data science, uh, data science uh, like uh, algorithm as well as technology has continue to increase. And uh, in parallel to those projects, I've been working mostly like on other projects, including health and climate. So these are, uh, I would say, projects that actually increase my, um, um, trigger my, uh, how would I say, um, my interest in data science. And uh, this is where like I've, uh, I've um, after my PhD, I've transitioned from uh, astronomy to mixed reality. So when we refer to mixed reality, what, uh, what we are trying to say is that we are referring to the blending of our, I would say, physical world and digital world. So mixed reality devices, such as the HoloLens or virt like um, virtual reality devices, will allow us to render, like for example, here an animation where we can see we are rendering like a bird into 3D in front of us. And you can imagine that we can also render a person and they will uh, a person in your room and they and they will look really like how they would actually appear so uh, last year microsoft uh, announced uh, about like microsoft mesh so i will just play uh, a quick video to introduce you to mesh here right now on the same trajectory as we put people first technology fades into the background it feels like anything but this changes the way we see the world and in turn changes the world we see these numbers are looking great actually there's promise in the possibilities and what we see and create next will stretch the imagination good morning sir good morning coming towards the world without boundaries good job a lot better than yesterday yeah a world where technology enhances, not limits, humanity. With people front, center, and in the spotlight. The future is here. And here can be anywhere. Introducing Microsoft Mesh. So um, I hope that this has given you a little bit 
uh, like of an idea about uh, what Microsoft Mesh is and the kind of technologies uh, that we are talking when we are speaking about like social presence. So it is really about like um, enabling people to, I would say, come together. And even though they are remote and they will be able to share like a free experience and you will feel like the remote people are actually with you through technologies such as like avatars and holoportations. So as a last note, I would say that uh, we are hiring. So for both full-time and internship opportunities, both in Cambridge and other location. So if you would like to learn more, please uh, browse through those link and enter the location uh, of your preferences. And if you want more information, please contact me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Zafira. Uh, I think the slides will be shared with everyone and they can get the links where they can apply for those opportunities. Um, this leads us to the Q&A session. I will just read out uh, the questions from the Q&A uh, to the directed presenter. The first question is for directed to Fanambi. Is your data science journey, in your data science journey, was it difficult to shift from French to English as Madagascar is a French speaking country? Um, the shift was not that difficult for me um, as I started to learn English at age eight. But I think the most difficult part of that was um, for me to um, to get uh, was getting to know technical terms. Um, I struggled a lot to learn um, and to get used with all of these technical terms at first. But um, for me, how I get used with them was to expose myself to English speakers network and to always search for um, English documents and articles. Because, you know, the more you immerse yourself in the field, um, the better you get in understanding those technical words. Okay, thank you. Um, the second question is from YouTube, from Cheyeza Mabuza. How can someone with a strong mathematical background working in the analytics space get into, into the data science field? Are there any communities or spaces that will lead that will help in this regard. I guess this is directed to all the presenters in this session. Um, anybody to answer the, the question? Safira? Christine, okay, uh, in that regard, I will move to the next question. We know that in women, we have what we call a biological clock. What, it's, what is it like to reconcile study and motherhood for these amazing women of science? I guess this is also uh, directed to all the presenters in this session. Zafira, you're on mute if you're speaking. Um, like, um, I didn't quite understand about the re reconciled study and motherhood for these amazing women, what does that really like? What, what's driving? I guess what they're asking is how do you juggle between motherhood and um, being a woman in, in, of science? I believe it depends on, for me, I would say it depends on priorities. Like, um, I would not say like, you need to prioritize work over like, uh, over your, your family. But I would say like, uh, try to find a way of balancing both in terms of what you really want to achieve in terms of your work and what, really, what, really, what you really want to deliver in terms of your family work as well. Because like you will need to balance that, which is very important. So for me, I would say it, uh, it is best to 
the best way is to communicate both in terms of like in terms of your work with your managers or in terms of uh, people in the work where you need more time for your family. Let's say uh, you need like for like six or seven hours per day to work or you need or you will need to have like lesser time uh, in work. So you will just need to communicate that with your managers compared to it just depends on you for, for sure. Okay. Um, um, I would also like to add here, sorry, that I know in many um, degree or funding funding structures nowadays, um, you have an option to include um, maternity leave um, in your, um, say, if you get funding for three years normally or three and a half years, um, that can be extended to, um, you know, to incorporate maternity leave if that is something that you believe you would like to be part of your journey. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, things are moving in sort of a positive direction in um, acknowledging that we need to be flexible to let people have, you know, a life outside of work as well. Okay. Thank you for answering the questions and thank you to everybody who asked a question. And this in this session, we are changing the theme to skills development, tools, and online resources. So for, for the, from, the, from the top of the day, we have had a plenary event, and this event will be followed by a two-day hackathon. In this session, we will um, give skills development initiative, which is the hackathon, where students practically will work on projects where they get introduced to data science and machine learning techniques. And Dr. Nikita will tell us more about that. But um, before that, let me introduce Nikita, who works at the IAU Office of Astronomy for Development, or AD, in Cape Town, as a Dara Big Data Fellow. Her goal is to provide increased exposure to data science and machine learning in the SKA Africa partner countries through big data hackathon events with the aim of increasing African data intensive research skills. She previously worked as an RFI scientist at the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory on Sarao and completed her PhD in cosmology and extragalactic astronomy at the University of the Western Cape. Nikita, you can go ahead and present. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sido. Okay. Let me just share. Okay. Can you see that? Yes, we can see. Yes, All right. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Um, hi. Afternoon, everyone. And I hope you've enjoyed uh, all the amazing talks uh, so far today. Um, I think they've all been really inspiring and um, given us real insight into what it's like at different levels uh, to work in this industry and study, of course, as well in this industry. Um, so now I'll be talking a bit about um, these uh, data science skills development initiatives that we that we run uh, big data hackathons. Um, so as a lot of you may know that we're running a hackathon um, in the next two, for the next two days. And, uh, but we've only had um, limited uh, spaces available. However, it is possible for anyone who wants to go through the hackathon uh, tutorials and project to do so. Um, and I'll, I'll give a bit of an, a brief overview about uh, this initiative and then at the end toward the end of the talk I'll take you through how you can actually um, also be a part of this hackathon and, and go through it uh, from home from wherever you are. Okay so um, this uh, initiative is a collaboration between three partner institutions uh, the IAU Office of Astronomy for Development which is based in Cape Town um, and here we use uh, different aspects of astronomy to positively impact uh, development and the sustainable development goals. And we partner with uh, DARA Big Data, where DARA stands for Development in Africa with Radio Astronomy, 
and IDEA, the Inter-University Institute uh, for Data Intensive Astronomy. And both, both these partners, um, their goal is to increase uh, capacity and expertise in data science or uh, data intensive research, um, with Dara focusing on the SKA telescopes, uh, African partner countries. Okay. Um, oh, yes, IDEA also provides uh, access to the research cloud facility for the purpose of all our, all our uh, events. A little bit more about uh, the focus areas of Dara Big Data. There are three, uh, three main focus areas, both in terms of the projects which they fund um, for their, uh, the, the postgraduate students, which they fund for, for their studies, as well as the kind of projects that we develop for these hackathon events. And those are in the areas of big data astronomy, big data health, and uh, big data agriculture. So you can think of things like um, using remote sensing data for um, looking at crop yields, for example, in agriculture or in health, looking at uh, images of um, radiology, uh, sort of images to look at uh, tumor detection, things like that. So what are, what are the goals of these kinds of hackathons? What are we trying to achieve? So, um, unlike conventional hackathons where you bring together uh, individuals to innovate and solve problems and these may be individuals who are already highly skilled um, at, at our hackathons we we'd be targeting um, postgraduates as well as young professionals in various uh, stem fields who have an interest in data science and would benefit from some hands-on experience with, uh, with working on real-world projects. So that is what we do. We uh, provide exposure to these uh, data science and machine learning techniques by giving participants a chance to work with, um, with real-world uh, data. And we have a mixture of sort of development-related projects and astronomy-related projects as well. So, um, for example, using remote sensing data, this is one of the examples shown on the screen, uh, using um, satellite data to look at the flood damage after a hurricane. That's one of the projects we've run. And then in terms of astronomy projects, you can uh, do things like image classification, which I think um, Zafir touched on a bit of it, uh, looking at pulses as well. Um, so, sort of looking at um, different kinds of morphology of uh, radio galaxies. There are also um, many different uh, projects that we have on our repository, which I'll show you uh, in a bit. Uh, they range from being more commercial, you know, looking at building um, recommendation apps like uh, movie and music recommendation apps, similar to what you would, uh, what they use for uh, Netflix and Spotify. Uh, looking at, um, like I said, flood analysis, um, simple things like uh, image classification, where you scrape scrape images off the web and then build simple um, models for being able to classify images as either, for example, a cat or a dog. Um, and then looking at uh, more astronomy related projects, uh, such as looking at uh, trying to distinguish astronomy sig uh, signals from um, space with uh, interference, uh, radio interference that we come across, and even looking for uh, signs of extraterrestrial life. So looking for alien techno signatures is one of our projects. Um, and then in the medical field as well, looking at um, uh, cancer detection patterns from just medical data. These are just a few um, points about what actually makes up a hackathon. Uh, so it's run typically over two to three days, uh, usually as part of a, sometimes as part of a longer event. Um, they're made, of, uh, made up of talks from invited guests, uh, projects, uh, tutorials that you work through um, uh, that are guided by, uh, with the assistance of tutors. And after working through these projects, um, uh, participants group into teams uh, to work on the hackathon task. Um, yes, we've also we, we we make sure that we invite various guests from industry and academia so that 
participants can get an idea of the broad uh, range of applications of data science. Um, participants learn a lot of soft skills like teamwork and leadership, in addition uh, to the technical skills. And the idea is that at the end of the um, two or three days that each team give a presentation and uh, prizes are awarded. Just to run through a few of the events that we've held um, so far. And I think some of the, the, the people who participated in these events are actually joining, uh, might be joining this, um, this webinar today. You might see themselves here. So this is a hackathon that we uh, hosted at the University of Zambia, um, a virtual hackathon, a pan-African hackathon with uh, covering 40 participants from 13 countries across Africa. It was run in partnership with the Space Generation um, Advisory Council um, and our winners are displayed here. It's really nice to work with the uh, people from different countries and nice mixture in each of the teams. In Mozambique last year, we held the first hackathon that was uh, run in a language other than English. So this hackathon was run uh, completely in Portuguese, including the, the talks that were given and the tutorials uh, were also translated to, to Portuguese. And most recently, we had an event in it, uh, at the Technical University of Kenya a uh, Big Data Kenya event um, last year. Okay, so now I'll get on to the, the project that we're looking at for, for this hackathon, and that involves NLP. And um, NLP has been brought up a few times today, first by uh, Kathleen and then also uh, Christine. Um, so for, you, for those of you who, who may not know, uh, what is NLP? So it's natural language processing. That's looking, it's a, a branch of uh, machine learning that deals with um, processing of human language, both in the form of uh, text, but also speech. Um, and I'm sure most of you have actually uh, come across uh, examples of NLP in your daily lives, uh, looking at things like autocorrect or predictive text when you're writing an email or, um, if you're on a certain website and a chatbot pops up, that's that's uh, uh, not a person on the other side. That's uh, that's NLP. You're chatting to a computer that's able to understand what you're asking and be able to respond effectively. Um, things like search engines, uh, Siri and Alexa, and then of course, like uh, Kathleen um, mentioned this morning, the important work of translation and. Um, which leads to uh, things being more accessible and, and inc more inclusion, uh, like Kathleen spoke about the inclusion of African languages. And um, then the next step is uh, what is sentiment analysis? So that's just where we try and uh, where we inter interpret text as either being positive or negative. Um, so sentiment analysis is used in uh, for many different um, applications. So people could uh, do brand monitoring, see how their, their product is doing uh, to be able to know whether they should make any changes, monitoring social media for that kind of thing, or looking at the perception of maybe politicians uh, amongst, um, amongst uh, citizens. Um, and of course, a lot of academic research as well. Um, and and uh, it, it going into sentiment analysis. So um, to not waste any more time and look at the project for this hackathon. So the project for this hackathon is around uh, collecting tweets um, related to COVID-19 and doing some NLP and some sentiment analysis using machine learning. So um, the idea is that uh, the, the tutorials would teach one how to collect uh, data from Twitter, collecting tweets from Twitter based on a, based on your search um, that you require. And then with this data, we then clean it, do some necessary pre-processing pre to make it um, suitable for, for uh, NLP. And finally, looking at um, how to then use machine learning 
in order to determine whether the sentiment uh, of this tweet is either negative, uh, actually negative, neutral, or positive, um, or just a binary classification problem where it's uh, negative or positive. Um, and we actually introduce something called transfer learning, which is actually uh, the most um, up-to-date and effective way of uh, doing sentiment analysis at the moment. And the idea behind transfer learning is that you are starting with a machine learning model that's already been trained. Um, a, a we call it a language model. It's a model that's already been trained on millions of pieces of text like Wikipedia articles. And this is so that it learns uh, the basic rules about um, human language. And then, so when you start with something like that, you can uh, then use your data to fine tune this model um, and then make predictions uh, that are um, relevant to, to your topic that you're looking at. So I'm going to just stop sharing my screen here and then go pull up the, um, share again and pull up the website. Okay. I think the website will be shared with you as well in the chat. Um, so yes, those of you who are taking part in the hackathon over the next two days can access all the tutorials and data at the Darabic, in the Darabic Data GitHub uh, repository created, uh, the COVID-19 Twitter project repository. And um, so if you come along here, you can um, easily clone the repository and um, just install all the requirements in this requirements.txt file uh, so that you'll be able to easily run the code. Uh, all the dependencies are in here. Um, if you're new to GitHub and not sure what I'm talking about, that's also fine. You can uh, come along and uh, follow these instructions to, to help you um, figure out how to do this. Um, so, before we get into the tutorials, I should just point out that in order to be able to collect data from Twitter, you first need to um, get uh, access to, to the Twitter API that allows uh, for data for tweets to be collected. And so if you just go to this file about the Twitter API setup, um, this file tells you all about how to get these four credentials that you'll need the API key, API key secrets, your access token, and access token secret. These are the four credentials that you'll need to acquire before being able to run the tutorials, because um, like I say, this allows you to collect data from Twitter. So um, I've, I've really detailed the uh, process of how to do this. Um, you just uh, create a Twitter account if you don't have one, then apply for a developer account, um, and then the la lastly, just apply for what's called uh, elevated access um, for your developer account. And you will then receive all the keys and, and tokens that you need, um, which will be pasted uh, in this file that I'll show soon. All right, so we look at tutorial one. Okay, so uh, here's the uh, file I was talking about is your Twitter credentials. Um, so you would uh, you would just copy and paste your credentials in here and save it. And then this is the uh, Jupyter Notebook for the first tutorial. And like I said, this tutorial just um, focuses on the collection and pre-processing of data from Twitter. Um, so we look at um, search words that you would uh, put in. Uh, so for example, we're looking at tweets around COVID-19, um, around the pandemic uh, at this, uh, for this project, but you could play around with it and of course collect tweets on anything you'd like um, and see what comes up. Um, we also show how to collect uh, tweets from um, specific regions around the world uh, by uh, using the latitude and longitude and search radius. So you can um, refine your searches um, to, to whichever part of the world you, you'd like to get tweets from. 
but please note that for the free access uh, uh, access level for for this um, API, you're only allowed it, uh, to access tweets from the past uh, seven days, unfortunately. So no access to historical data. Um, all right, and then so that's what uh, the first tutorial is about. Um, We'll leave time for questions at the end, don't worry if there are any questions. The second tutorial, okay, so we have, uh, I've shown you how to, well, that there's a tutorial which shows you how to collect and clean data. Um, for the tutorials, uh, tutorials two and three, we have a data set that's already been, uh, so we've already collected tweets and uh, done the necessary pre-processing and these tweets have also been labeled. So we'll do, it's a, a supervised machine learning problem. So we, we've, we've already provided them with sentiment labels. Um, so for this uh, second tutorial, it just shows you about existing toolkits, existing uh, libraries that um, can perform sentiment analysis and the kind of methods they use. Um, so this just lets you explore those existing, ex existing libraries. You can look at um, how accurate they are, um, where, uh, where the shortfalls are with using uh, these kinds of libraries. Um, there's two that we explore, text blob and fader. Um, and the point here is to show you that, yes, we can, we can do a lot with the existing libraries, but there are certain shortfalls. Um, but just to let you know that these exist and can be useful. Um, but uh, the main thing that we want to get to, obviously, is how to use machine learning um, in order to make uh, sentiment predictions. And that's where tutorial three comes in. So we go over, again, we use the same data sets, uh, I should say, um, the ones that have, uh, where we've already collected tweets around COVID-19 and done the pre-processing and um, given them sentiment labels. Uh, so it's, yes, working with labeled data. Um, we look at classical machine learning approaches. Uh, so just uh, normal classification models that you would maybe be familiar with that already. Um, if not, there are many links and many explanations. The all tutorials are quite detailed. So if you go through them slowly and um, Methodically, you should be able to um, do this without any other assistance. Um, if you have a question, it's most likely answered in the text in the tutorial. So please read through it uh, quite carefully. Uh, there's lots of, like I say, lots of links to other various platforms that will help explain what's going on in the tutorials. Um, so you, yes, you can choose any of these common well-known classifiers see how they perform in terms of uh, being able to um, predict the sentiment of the tweets. And uh, this just shows you how to make new predictions. So to use your trained model to make uh, predictions for new tweets that you may collect. So you can train the model and then collect new tweets and see how well these models, uh, or what, you know, what kind of, uh, sentiments they, they, they assign to, to tweets that are outside of the tra training and uh, test data for new data. Okay, and then finally, we get to transfer learning, which I spoke about already. Um, I've, uh, we use a pre-trained language model called BERT. I won't get into uh, the details around BERT, but there is um, an explanation uh, in the tutorial, as well as a link to the paper, if you're really interested. Um, but yes, you, you should be able to run this. Uh, it does, it, it is quite um, computationally intensive. It will take uh, quite a while if you run it locally. So I, I suggest using something like uh, Google Colab, um, which is free, um, to run these if it's uh, taking a while. Um, yeah, so we look at uh, how well transfer learning does in comparison to the classical models. And um, 
what the, you know, the, the benefits uh, of using transfer learning. And I think this will be apparent when you run it and look at the performance. Um, and very uh, lastly, we have something called uh, COVID Twitterbert uh, or CTBert. So like I mentioned, a language model is trained on millions of pieces of uh, text. And um, for BERT, that was millions of uh, Wikipedia articles. But in terms of the COVID Twitter BERT, they've actually trained, uh, trained the model on um, tweets related to COVID. So very, very relevant to what we're doing, um, which, which imp improves the performance as you'd expect. Um, okay, so that's basically the tutorials. Uh, the, the hackathon task is um, also stated at the end of this tutorial. Um, but so yes, yeah, so anyone who, who wants to take part in this hackathon can do so um, by coming and going through uh, cloning this uh, repository and working through the tutorials. Uh, the data is all available. Um, so are all the dependencies. And um, I, I hope that if you want to learn a bit more about NLP, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll do so. Um, so I think that's, that's it for me. And I'm, I'm happy to take any questions about the hackathon if anyone has anything they'd like to know. Thank you. Thank you, Nikita. Um, for giving us the run through the project as well as NLP. For now, I do not see any questions in the Q&A, so I assume people understood you very well. Uh, oh, there's a question. For the final presentation, uh, I think this question is not complete. Oh, what, are, what is expected of us in the final presentation? Oh, okay. So I think this is a question from one of the hackathon participants. Uh, <laughs> you'll get, uh, so everyone who's taking part in the actual hackathon over the next two days, you'll get an email shortly um, detailing the, uh, the instructions and the hackathon task, and you'll know what's uh, expected of you. But yeah, like I said, you work through these tutorials, and at the end of the tutorial, there's a task that's presented, which you then work work on uh, but the tutorial the idea is that the tutorials will provide you with all the tools that you need um, in order to be able to take on the hackathon task so it's it's meant to provide a it's a really um supportive and friendly environment to learn data science because uh, it's um it's not throwing you in the deep end we we try and provide a lot of the tools and, and, and techniques that you will need in order to complete the task, uh, they're already provided to you in the tutorials. Okay, thank you. Um, there's another question. Hi, I'm currently interested in working or building projects in GitHub. How can I go about it? Do I need to have data or data is already available? Um, so I guess uh, that depends on, you know, what uh, project you're working on and what area it's in. Um, uh, are you, I'm not sure if you're referring to this project, um, but it looks like you're talking about uh, your own, your own projects. Um, uh, I think if you, if you have a, I'm not sure if you have an existing GitHub account. Um, if you don't, uh, there's many uh, videos on YouTube uh, introducing GitHub, um, how it works and um, how to collaborate with others. Um, uh, but if you want to uh, you know, build, uh, start your own projects, I would maybe suggest working with um, existing projects uh, for now that you can perhaps contribute to um, on GitHub contribute to existing projects and repositories. Okay, thank you, Nikita. Uh, one more question before we can close off. There is a question on the chat where they are asking, can you please elaborate more about BERT? <laughs> about BERT, okay. Um, all right, so uh, 
expert, uh, I forget what it stands for, bi-directional, um, let's pull up this, this hack again. Anyway, um, so BERT is a language model. Uh, so a, a language model, a good language model should be able to predict the next, essentially predict the next word in a sentence. Um, uh, that's what a good language model does. So like, uh, like I mentioned, uh, it's, it's, it's it, how BERT actually works is very complicated and too much to get into in the time we have. Um, but uh, if you go to the tutorial, uh, there's a link to the paper, like I've, like I've said, but that's the basic uh, gist of it is that um, it's, a, it's a machine learning classification um, technique where you take a model that's already been for NLP that's already been trained. Uh, it's basically using, yes, it's called transfer learning because you transfer all the knowledge that you've learned um, from a model that's been trained on millions of pieces of text so that you don't have to do this. So um, if you have, uh, for example, limited uh, data or a very small data set, usually this is quite a stumbling uh, block in, in machine learning because to achieve um, uh, good uh, classification models, you need usually a, a large amount of training data. But when you use something like transfer learning, it's, uh, it's like cheating a bit because you you're using a pre-trained language model, something that's already been trained on a lot, a lot of data and has learned the nuances and the, the uh, cause language is a very complicated thing uh, for a computer to understand uh, with a human language and all its different rules and slang and um, uh, con to get context and things. So uh, it's very, it's a huge advantage in NLP to use a, a pre-trained language model and um, then put in your data, which helps to fine tune it. So that we, we for example, we use our tweets um, from uh, around COVID-19 to fine tune this model so that uh, it learns, it learns about, it's already learned about human language. Now it learns uh, based on the tweets that we've collected and with, those two things, it can then um, make predictions on the sentiment of the, the tweets. So whether the whether the tweets are likely to be positive or neutral in sentiment. I hope that's okay. Thank you, Nikita. Uh, we are running out of time, but we have two more questions. I don't know if you can uh, answer them via uh, typing. Uh, no, I'll just uh, I'll just uh, say really quickly. Um, so sorry. Uh, yeah. No, by those who um, are actually taking part in the hackathon have been contacted and are part of teams. And um, unfortunately, if you've not, uh, yeah, if um, that hasn't happened, uh, cloning them and working through them on your own is uh, just for you to to learn. It's uh, um, at your own pace, but um, you're not actually. You're just did, unfortunately, for the actual the actual event, the actual hackathon. But you can maybe apply it to future hackathons. Okay. Um, I shall hand over to Bonita for the final closing words. Okay. Thank you, Sidul. So I think that this brings us to the end of today's event. And just I think looking back at all the speakers from today. I think there's a lot of role models and inspiration that we can find from all these different speakers, from Kathleen, who introduced us to how some of these technologies should be inclusive of different African languages or indigenous languages, to our panel of wonderful, or what I think is remarkable speakers, um, just telling us a bit more about their journey, um, Port Laco, um, I always enjoy conversations with Putlaka. She's young and energetic um, and always has a view and is passionate about, you know, gender equality in STEM. So I've really enjoyed the panel discussion as well. And this afternoon, just showcasing um, women who, whether they were in their mid and senior um, level of professions in data sciences, to younger women. And that is just showcase what different journeys different females have experienced. And I think going back to what the, the aim of this event was and 
I think initially talking to Lindsay um, about the, the, the Women in Data Science report, what we can implement um, that is going to make a difference. I think this event is exactly what we thought it would be um, in terms of showcasing remarkable women in the fields of data science, but also more broadly, women who want to make a difference in STEM, as well as showing more inclusion of women in frontier technologies, frontier types of roles where women can be promoted more into these types of roles. And that's exactly what, what this day has shown and what a remarkable way to celebrate um, International Women's Day. So uh, I think with that, um, if you have any other remarks or comments, please do post it in the chat, uh, which will be open for just a little while um, on any comments or that you would like to um, leave about the event, about speakers. Um, we're happy to review those comments um, as part of reviewing this actual event. Um, and I think for closing, I, I want to say thank you to the organizers of this event and to all our speakers. Um, it, I, I think everything has turned out very well. Um, I also just want to say thank you um, to the woman who is in the background, Lindsay Stirrup. Lindsay, um, I'm not sure if you can turn on your camera, but I think Lindsay has been the glue to hosting this event. <laughs> and I just want to say thank you, Lindsay, for, for this. And I know that um, throughout these months of planning, um, Lindsay, I, I know that we can reach you almost at any time <laughs> and she's there to answer any questions. So I just want to say a big thank you, um, especially from the South African um, part of the, the organization. Thank you for, for, for doing this and for, for allowing us to do this. So um, Lindsay, I don't know, do you want to say something before we leave? Only very, very quickly, um, just to say thank you so much to our uh, speakers. It's been a wonderful, wonderful day. Honestly, you've really made such a, a fantastic day. And I really hope that this will lead to a, a really great network forming of data scientists across Africa. That's the aim of our event. And that's actually, you know, really important. So thank you, everybody, for taking part. Thanks for everybody who came. Thanks for everybody who chaired sessions, um, who spoke. It's been absolutely wonderful. Um, thank you. And um, I just want to say, you can still follow um, all the activities of Dara Big Data um, on Twitter as well. Lindsay, I think you can also share. Um, I, I do advertise many of the opportunities through the South African Dara Big Data Partnership, um, as well as Soraya, opportunities through Soraya, um, through my LinkedIn profile. So I'm happy for people to join that um, if they, they are interested. And um, also feel, feel free to contact Lindsay if there's anything in particular um, that you're looking for. Um, yeah, and I think that brings us to an end. Thank you very much to everyone and enjoy the rest of your Women's Day. <laughs>